Hi, my name is Kyle Murphy, and I'm a senior policy manager at the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab at MIT. I'm here to talk about how to think about what we mean by social impact and how to test it. Decades of research show that there are many complex drivers of poverty, and at JPAL we conduct rigorous impact evaluation to shed light on this complexity. Our work is just part of the solution, but by testing, innovating, and finding answers to critical questions, we help governments, donors, NGOs, and others be more effective. The global community has been tackling widespread poverty for many decades, but billions of people still struggle to make ends meet, and millions remain in extreme poverty. This is the case within coffee value chains as well, and according to an analysis by Inveritas, 44% of coffee farmers live in poverty, half of those in extreme poverty as defined by World Bank standards, and that's 5.5 million people worldwide. Of course, this number doesn't include the many millions more who provide labor on these farms picking and processing coffee, for whom coffee production is a large portion of their livelihoods as well. At the same time, coffee has the great potential to connect farmers to markets and lift incomes. In much of our work on agriculture at JPAL, we're focused on basic grain farmers whose marketing options are often limited to local and national markets, which are poorly interlinked. But with coffee, and specialty coffee in particular, there's great potential for connecting farmers to broader markets and increasing incomes through coffee. Of course, this is widely recognized by the industry and lots of great work is being done by different actors in the coffee world to help increase the benefits to smallholder farmers. But th this social impact requires as much careful consideration as the business side to make it a reality. Economic development activities can sometimes seem like a secondary concern or that they'll automatically work without much consideration uh, of measuring their effectiveness. At JPAL, we conduct research to find answers to some of the complex questions around poverty. And these include many age-old questions, but also new evolving challenges like rising inequality, the effects of climate change, persistent poverty in countries where overall income is rising, for example. And our affiliated researchers try to understand the conditions and causes of poverty and to tailor solutions to tackle these problems. By using the creative potential of our researchers, innovating on social programs and testing them, we help different programs targeting poverty be more effective, uh, I, hopefully improving lives for millions of people. And our hope is that these lessons and methods can be used to uh, poverty alleviations in the coffee world as well to make them more impactful. So I wanna take a step back and think through what we actually mean when we say impact and how we think about measuring it. For example, you might have a program that provides information to farmers through cell phones. And imagine here on the y-axis, we're tracking the yields over time. So the program starts in the middle and s simply from this graph, we can see all the rise in yields over time for this population. However, there may be many factors affecting yields beyond our extension program at the same time. It could be that it's just a good year for everyone, yields are going up, or it could be that there's another program uh, that's happening simultaneously driving the change. So simply looking at what happened before and after is not likely to give us a good estimate of the effects of the program on outcomes for farmers. The key to knowing what's happened is to be able to say what would have happened in the absence of the program uh, had the, and compare it to what happened uh, with our intervention. So in this case, the inf impact is not the difference between the beginning and ending of this yellow line, but rather what happened uh, on this blue line. So it's the difference between the yellow dot and the blue dot at the end of the program. So what would have happened without the program compared to what happened to our farmers who received the extension service. In order to measure impact, we wanna know what happened and then compare it to uh, this counterfactual world. So impact can be defined as a comparison between the outcome sometime after the program has been introduced and the outcome at that same point in time had the program not been introduced. So the difference between the factual and the counterfactual is the impact of the program. 
to demonstrate a little more in depth the importance of critically considering the counterfactual, uh, I want to go through a couple more possible scenarios with our hypothetical extension program. Like in the previous world, we see here an example where yields were rising over time. Uh, so what, what's the impact of the program? Even though the yields grew, we might have been in a situation where in the absence of this extension program, the counterfactual world, yields may have grown even more. It could be the advice was bad and farmers took it and had poorer outcomes. Perhaps even more importantly, we could have a, a world like this where farmers' incomes are going down and we might be tempted to say that the program didn't work. However, it's an example of a positive impact despite the fact that the outcome went down from the baseline. Yields were falling, but with the program, they fell less than they would have otherwise. So what we're seeing is a protective impact from the program. Without a clear counterfactual, we would miss the pro positive impacts uh, in this case. Even though the counterfactual is a very abstract concept, it's fundamental to expressing the impact that a program has. However, it can never be directly observed. It's not possible to sim simultaneously know what an individual would have achieved both with and without the program. Uh, one way to get an idea of the counterfactual and to measure the true impacts of a program is through randomized evaluations. And these are the types of uh, evaluations that JPAL specializes in. Randomized evaluations can help disentangle the effects of a program from other factors that might affect the outcome of interest. So for example, imagine we're continuing we, with this digital extension program and we want to measure the yields through a randomized evaluation. So we'll, we determine the eligibility requirements such that only farmers within a certain geography receive the extension service. And within this group, there may be a variation in farmer characteristics. Some will be more experienced, more resourced, uh, and stronger overall, denoted by the darkest orange here, and some will, may be weaker, denoted by the lightest orange. So how, how will we measure the impact? We'd like to know how much of the change in yields is attributable directly to our extension program versus other factors such as access to resources at home or some factors uh, we can observe like how motivated the farmers are. One option would be to let extension agents or someone else like lead farmers determine who in this eligible population should receive the new extension program and then compare their outcomes to another group of eligible, eligible farmers that did not receive it. Uh, the extension agents might ex assign extension to those they feel will be most likely to take up the advice. So this could be farmers already using additional inputs or who've done well in previous uh, farmer field schools. Yet this means that the farmers who receive the program are systematically different, in this case systematically stronger, from those who don't. As a result, we can't disentangle the effect of the extension program uh, from the effect of farmers' inherent abilities and resources and other uh, factors on their yields. For example, it could be that the program was really effective and that the farmers wouldn't have done well without it. But it could also be that the farmers would have caught up anyways and that the program didn't do much. To be able to tell between these two, we we'd need to compare how the farmers would have done with the program to how they would have done without the program, the counterfactual as I described earlier. In an ideal world, we would observe the counterfactual by seeing how a group of farmers did with the extension program, then going back in time and seeing how the same farmers did without the program, but of course that's uh, impossible, but we can achieve a similar goal by randomly assigning individuals to either receive the program, which we call the intervention group, or not, the comparison group. So how might this work in practice? Before we start our digital extension service, we would randomly assign individuals to comparison and intervention groups. So in expectation, the two groups have comparable characteristics at baseline, though in practice, they may look a, very, a, a bit different. So if you imagine taking two people at random off the street, they're likely to be quite different from each other. But the key here is as the sample size grow and we have more observations and more farmers, more, the both groups look more and more like the underlying population and the differences between them at baseline are likely to be negligible. 
Because the only systematic difference then between the two groups is the presence of the extension program, we can assume that they are comparable in terms of average individual characteristics and then attribute the difference in any outcomes on yields directly to the extension service with a high degree of confidence. So that's to say that randomization allows a causal interpretation of the difference between uh, the farmers that received the extension service and the comparison group that did not. So JPL's network of affiliates has carried out more than 1,000 randomized evaluations in settings around the world. So these are on a wide variety of topics, including a good deal of evidence on programs targeted in the agricultural sector. At JPL, uh, we benefit from seeing the big picture through this vast body of research. We can find cross-cutting themes, pull out policy lessons, and inform future programs and policies. Though it's unlikely that there will be an exact evaluation of the same program in the same setting in which you work, our focus on theory-driven research means that you can likely draw lessons from existing studies to inform a new program. In agriculture, much of the work is focused on many potentially valuable technologies which suffer from low adoption by farmers, so, such as fertilizer, improved seeds, and the like, and then breaking down the constraints preventing farmers from taking profitable advantage of those technologies. So this has led to good literature on the most effective ways to protect farmers from weather-based risk, providing timely credit and uh, information services, all of which can be informative when designing a new program. Uh, so I want to leave you with three ideas for thinking about uh, how this work can inform your investments in social impact in coffee. So first, development is not easy, nor should we expect it to be. Uh, poverty is a complex and persistent problem, and despite decades of work, no silver bullet solutions have emerged. To do this better, uh, evaluating impact is a difficult but necessary tool if we care about the impact of these programs. Randomized evaluations create very valuable lessons but take a lot of coordination between implementers and researchers. They need to be in place before a program starts and they can be expensive and take a long time to produce results. However, we can learn from evaluations by others and thanks to the work of many talented academics, they're now deep resources on a number of topics to draw from when thinking about designing a new program. And finally, good intentions and passion are necessary for doing this work, but they don't substitute for hard-headed analysis. And we can do better through continuing to innovate, measuring the impacts of those programs well, and using those lessons to improve future implementation. So now, Professor Rocco Machiavello, who's a JPAL affiliate and associate professor of management at the London School of Economics, will talk a bit how he's used uh, impact evaluation in the coffee sector and share some valuable lessons for your work. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks for inviting me. My name is Rocco Machiavello. I'm from the LSE. I'm going to talk about supply chain interventions in coffee and learning opportunities. In the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about a special relationship. The relationship between uh, Mutoni and Annalisa. Mutoni is a young, hardworking mother of three living in Maraba in the southern part of Rwanda. And Annalisa is also young and hardworking. She left Italy to complete her uh, master's degree in London. And now she's looking forward to a career uh, filled with purpose. And uh, during her degree, she has uh, met many people from different cultures and backgrounds. And over countless many cups of coffees, she has discussed ways to make the world a better place. Now she's drinking coffee that has been uh, farmed and painfully uh, harvested, very carefully harvested, by um, Mutoni. So Annalisa and Mutoni, they are deeply connected in this world. Mutoni and Annalisa are connected by the coffee supply chain. Now, in a nutshell, Mutoni and millions of farmers uh, around the world, like her, uh, form the supply of coffee. If the price that they can get go up, they will produce more coffee or maybe higher quality coffee. And that is what gives you the supply curve. Similarly, Annalisa and millions of coffee drinkers, like her, form the demand of coffee. Annalisa is willing to pay a non-trivial price premium to drink a good cup of coffee. But in general, 
when there is a lot of coffee in the market, prices will have to come down a little bit so that consumers are willing to drink as much coffee as there is and as it is supplied. And this is what gives you the demand curve. There's no invisible hand taking the coffee from uh, Mutoni to uh, Annalisa, of course. There is the work and task performed by many, many, many people in between. There is the work, the skills, the passion of many people. And uh, this is what the coffee supply chain is. Now, each step of the chain performs tasks that are needed to connect Mutoni and Annalisa. For example, the retailer needs to pay the landlord, needs to pay taxes, maybe VAT, other sales taxes, uh, needs to hire, train and pay the baristas. And then, of course, at the end of the day, she needs to be left with the amount of profit that makes it worthwhile for her to actually take Mutoni's coffee and serve it to, uh, to, uh, to Annalisa. This means that uh, not all that Annalisa is willing to pay can be transferred to Mutoni. And in fact, you know, before the retailer, there are the rosters that also do a very important job and then trading companies and then maybe an exporting company in the sourcing country. And then maybe before that, a meal or a set of collectors. And then, of course, many other actors, including banks, transport company, insurance company, logistics, and so forth. And so at the end of the day, what Mutoni gets for her coffee is not very much. It's not a large share of what uh, Annalisa is willing to pay. And her income, the difference between her production costs and her, and, her, and, her, and her revenues, is also not very large. It's not just time, in fact. It's also very volatile, unpredictable, difficult to understand. Maybe it comes all at harvest season. Well, in fact, uh, Mutoni would like to have uh, some of her income a little bit before so that she can pay for input without having to borrow. Or maybe a little bit after so that she can pay for school uniform for her kids. So what can be done to improve Mutoni's income? Uh, now, note that I'm not even questioning whether we should pose this question. But I want to pause a second and notice that uh, you might say that things are actually all right the way they are. That the reason why Mutoni's income is low is because there is too much coffee in the market. Or because uh, the value and therefore the cost of uh, performing all the different services that comes after Mutoni is very large. And that's why Mutoni's income is low. And maybe this is a good thing. If Mutoni's and other farmers' income is low, they will little by little abandon coffee. That will diminish supply. That will increase prices and uh, resources will be um, efficiently allocated when we don't think just about the coffee sector, but we think more broadly about other sectors. I think there's a merit in this view, and we should not dismiss it as a silly view. Quite the contrary. However, whether this view is correct or not, critically hinges on whether markets in between Mutoni and Annalisa works well or not. And there are many people that think that these markets don't work well, but I don't think that this is a debate that can be settled by speculating. This is really a debate that uh, we can kind of only approach with the hard-nosed approach that uh, looks at data and kind of trying to understand really how these markets work and if they don't work perfectly, why is it that they don't work perfectly and what can be done about it. Now, I'll show you later some data suggesting indeed that the markets in between Mutonis and Analisa might not work perfectly um, um, and that therefore the simple demand and supply story might not be working the way we want it to work. So fundamentally, going back to the question, there are two approaches to improve Mutoni's income. The first approach is simply to make Mutoni's more productive, to lower her production cost. There's many good arguments for interventions on this side. For instance, knowledge of uh, good management practices for the farm, farming and harvesting practices is a public good. It will tend to be underprovided. R&D for good varieties and other input also is a public good, so will tend to be underprovided. Maybe extension services typically are understaffed or might encounter other difficulties. So again, a reason for intervention. I'm not going to spend a lot more time on this type of intervention for a couple of reasons. Though. The first one is that if we make everybody more productive, then supply will increase and that will, try to, that will tend to drive uh, prices received by Mutonis and others down. And so that will eat, of course, uh, could potentially eat a big chunk of the gains that we have been trying to achieve. Now, the extent to which there will be downward pressure on prices, of course, will be quite context-specific, but it's a possibility. Second, to the extent that that happens, Mutoni might also not be 
uh, willing or uh, very keen to participate in activities that make her more productive. And um, this is because it's very hard to change the way we do things. It's uh, difficult to learn new things. And therefore, we need to make sure that Mutoni sees the rewards for her effort in trying and adopting new things uh, in order for, for us to expect her to be willing to do so. And so, even though this kind of intervention can be very uh, important, I'm going to spend more time focusing on the other type of intervention, which is to think about ways in which we can increase the prices that are perceived by farmers um, at the farm gate. Here again, there are essentially two ways in which we can increase farm gate prices. Fundamentally, farm gate prices, holding other things constant, are driven by Annalisa willingness to pay, and how much of that willingness to pay is transmitted down to the farm gate. So the two paths, which are not mutually exclusive, as it might be suggested by this picture, are to either focus on the price transmission or to focus on changing what the farmers are actually selling. Let me start with the price transmission. Here is data from the Colombia coffee chain, which I've studied in quite detail with uh, Pepita Miguel Florenza. On the right side of the figure, you see a bar, and the bar represents the price premium per kilogram of export coffee uh, at the export gate for uh, Supremo coffee, relative to standard coffee. And there is a quite healthy and substantial price premium that uh, foreign buyers are willing to pay for Supremo coffee from Colombia. On the left-hand side, however, is the price premium that beans that end up being Supremo at the export gates command at the farm gate. And essentially, that price premium is completely dissipated. So why is it that there is such a low price premium for quality in the Colombia chain? And I should say, in many other chains for which we have data. When economists see low price premium, uh, well, low price transmission, the first thing that they will think about is um, monopsony power. There's lack of competition in the chain, buyers that have a lot of power are going to put downward pressure and they're not going to transmit uh, price premium at the export gate. Now, I'm not going to say that uh, market power is not a problem in the coffee chain, in the domestic coffee chain, and let alone in the international coffee chain, where I don't even have the data to think about it. I would just say, I would just have, want to put uh, forward a word of caution, okay, based on a study that I've done in the context of Rwanda with Amit Morcheria. On the left-hand side, you see uh, a map of Rwanda. Each red dot is a geocoded mill washing station in 2012. There were more than 200 coffee washing stations at that time. And so across this washing station, there's quite a lot of variation in the degree of competition between them. There are some places that are very densely populated by washing stations and where competition is very intense, and other places where competition is a little bit less so. What we see on the right-hand side of the graph is that more competition is associated with the lower likelihood that the mills gives inputs and loans to farmers before harvest, and with the lower likelihood that the mills also pay second payments to farmers. We also don't find any effect of competition on prices paid to farmers. So this suggests that uh, the market might generate in certain circumstances too much competition. And why is it that the market generates too much competition? Or when is it that that happens? Well, this happens when contracts are hard to enforce or promises are difficult uh, to be kept. In particular, here is an example of a promise that is uh, difficult to keep or, you know, that might be broken. With another colleague, Arthur Bluin, we uh, gathered data on uh, several thousands of contracts between coffee exporters and coffee buyers. What we see is that uh, when the New York Sea price suddenly increases over, over the duration of the forward contract, the likelihood that the exporter defaults on the contract also increases if the contract is a fixed price. Nothing happens if the contract is in the differential price. So, obviously, this story identifies a trade-off between um, price risk and counterparty risk, but also it hints at the possibility that uh, some, at least, of these contractual default are actually opportunistic in nature. So, the problem that promises can be broken appears to be a relevant problem at this stage of the chain between the exporters and the foreign buyers. Now, of course, few contracts get defaulted, but it's the possibility that the contract might be defaulted upon that, of course, drives then the way the deal and the relationship evolve. And similar type of promises can be broken between the mills and the exporters inside the domestic chains. They can also be broken between the farmers and the mills. If, for instance, the farmers expect a second payment that then is renegotiated down by the mill. 
So a fundamental challenge of the chain is that uh, contracts are hard to enforce and promises might be broken along all steps of the chain. And when that happens, we don't expect markets to work as well as uh, the standard logic would suggest. We can now go back to Colombia. And with Pepita, we also noticed that the AAA Sustainable Quality Program, which essentially only buys Supremo coffee, also pay a very large premium for the coffee of the export gate, larger than the market premium. But what is interesting is that essentially all the additional premium that is paid at the export gate is passed back to the farmer. So why is it that this program achieves essentially a much stronger uh, price transmission or quality premium transmission back to the farmers than uh, um, the standard coffee, the standard Supremo coffee achieves? We think that this is down to two fundamental reasons. The first one is that the contract between the buyer and the exporter specifies the, the price premium that needs to be paid to farmers. This is a form of vertical restraint that is very common in, uh, in many supply chains, in manufacturing and in, and in distribution. And uh, I'm going to come back to these type of contracts in a second. The second reason is that, of course, the buyer commits to buy essentially or almost all of the production of the farmers that are in the program. So there is no over certification in a buyer driven um, program like the one that we have studied here. So this type of contract, the vertical restraint that specifies the price to be paid to the premium, is difficult to achieve in practice. It requires a lot of trust between all actors in the supply chain. And it might be difficult to implement this type of contract even for a buyer that is large and well intended. And uh, why is it? Well, the buyer needs to trust the exporter and maybe even the exporter supplier, because the exporter might not be the one directly sourcing coffee from the farmers, that the price premium and whatever other condition is attached to the, to the transaction is actually being paid to the farmer. Um, and, you know, we know from the work on certifications that these contracts are difficult to enforce and police. But on the seller side, there is also a problem because the buyer is actually promising a price premium above market, uh, both to the exporter and to the farmers. And so both the farmer and the exporter need to believe that if circumstances change, the buyer is going to pull that promise and pay the premium. So more generally, I would say that uh, there are many learning opportunities to try to understand how companies organize their sourcing and how different sourcing practices impact both profitability as well as, at the end of the day, uh, farmers' income. And in particular, this buyer-driven program, I think, here that uh, present the um, biggest opportunity for collaboration to sort of fine-tune and explore different ways of, uh, of doing things. A lot of the questions can be looked at with randomized control trial. In other, other questions, randomized control trials are not practical, but that's not an argument for not uh, uh, taking a serious look at the data. So we mentioned that it's challenging to uh, set up these um, um, vertical restraints in the, in the supply chain and they require a lot of trust. So here is an area where potentially blockchain technology could uh, have a, a significant impact. In principle, a blockchain platform makes it easier for a buyer roster to have a contract with the exporter that specifies the price that the farmer needs to get. Mm -hmm. And if the farmer is part of the platform, um, she will be able, essentially, to police that the price is actually being paid. Notice that this works well for the prices. It might not work well for other attributes that we might want to include in that particular contract. So the message here is that um, blockchain technology can potentially help improve the way supply chains function in this particular respect. There might be many other great things about blockchain technology. I'm here focusing only on this aspect. And indeed, we do see initiatives in the marketplace, uh, startups as well as from larger companies, even government, that are entering this space and are planning to use blockchain technology to make supply chains more efficient. Now, as you try something new, be the blockchain technology in a supply chain, be another buyer-driven program, be just simply a different type of contract that you want to try to have with your um, uh, exporter in the, in the origin country, whenever you try something new, you're going to stumble upon a number of questions. For instance, what is the impact of enrolling farmers on the blockchain platform if that's what you're doing? Um, what is the driver of adoption or utilization among the farmers? What is the impact of the different contractual terms on the farmers and on my suppliers? And how should we structure payment to farmers or how should we structure payment to suppliers and farmers? Whenever you encounter that type of question, think of it as, a monitor, as an opportunity for evaluation and learning, I think. Take a hard-nosed approach, look at the data, tell exactly what, the, try to understand what the data are telling you, and perhaps consider trying different things and learning carefully from, uh, 
from these things that you have tried. Now I want to go back to the two parts. So we talked a lot about price transmission. Now I want to think a little bit about uh, what is it that farmers are selling. And uh, this is actually bringing us back to um, Motori and Analisa. What is Analisa actually buying from Motori? Well, Analisa is buying uh, a few coffee beans, but a few coffee beans that uh, are being collected, processed, handled, tried, financed, transported, insured, imported, stored, roasted, brewed, and served by many well-intended, often very passionate people. So this is why at the end of the day, Mutoni cannot get a very large share or a very high price uh, for a given willingness to pay. But what could Annalisa actually buy from uh, Mutoni? Well, she could buy a five minute trip to the heart of Africa. She could buy a cleaner river, maybe a protected canopy. She could buy a school uniform. She could buy a story. And uh, what is happening is that uh, digital platforms are actually making it increasingly possible for Mutoni to bundle these other services with the coffee that she's selling to Annalisa. I think this is gonna create a very different economics, a very different ecosystem potentially in the chain. And uh, as with anything new, it's going to uh, generate a lot of questions. What is Annalisa willing to pay for among all these different attributes? And uh, does Annalisa need to trust the system or is it enough that uh, she feels good about it, that she feels good about what she thinks she's purchasing? And if she needs to trust, who owns that trust? The brand? Do you need a third party? Does it need to be uh, um, NGOs that step in? And so forth. So there's going to be plenty of opportunities to learn, experiment and try out new things, even in that space. At the end of the day, Annalisa and Mutoni are connected by the coffee chain. And uh, by working together, building trust and trying to build trust in the chain, using data to learn together, I think we can make the, for a better cup of coffee for Mutoni and for Annalisa alike. Thank you so much. For the papers, a chat or any question, just feel free to get in touch by email at my LSC address. Thank you.